I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. Patience, impatience in relationships. As you may know, I've been exploring the topic of how do we live together, which uh, in America, at least, as we approach an extremely important and significant election, with a lot of strong feelings on many sides, it is very prominent in the minds of, of many people, how do we live together at the level of a roommate, a parent and a child, a child and a parent, uh, neighbors, people living in, people in organizations, organizations with each other, communities with each other, states with each other, countries, the whole wide world. How do we live together as the whole human tribe? At that scale, all eight billion of us sitting around a metaphorical campfire, staring at each other, wondering, what the heck? How did we get here? And what do we need to do about it? So we have a world that works for everyone, not just for some of us. So how do we live together, particularly at the local level of interactions uh, with other people, friends and family, neighbors, coworkers, and so forth? How do we actually do it? So I've been exploring a variety of topics there. Uh, last time I explored celebrating, we're appreciating the sheer humanness of other people and yourself as an aid to relationships. And frankly, as I acknowledged, as a setup for getting into this topic about patience with other people. So now here we are, let's explore patience. You may know that in the Buddhist tradition, there is this idea of uh, qualities, virtues, personal characteristics that one can perfect over a life of practice and are perfected in a fully, stably enlightened being. They're called perfections, a translation of paramis or paramitas. Uh, traditionally, there were six. They've become more elaborated to a list of 10. If you look on Wikipedia for paramis, P-A-R-A-M-I in English, or Buddhist perfections or similar terms, you'll find the full list. Patience is on that list, and also, obviously, in other traditions, including secular ones of ordinary virtues, uh, patience is really appreciated and can be a highly underrated virtue. One that, frankly, has been very important for me personally to develop, partly because I tend to move quickly and be goal-directed and want to get a lot of stuff done in a limited amount of time. Um, also, we live in a culture that is really impatient. Fast food, fast everything. You know, you pick up your phone and you're trying to get online and it takes an extra three seconds to load. What? Or where's my wet, you know, cell signal? Or you send someone a text and half an hour later, you send them another text. Did you get my text? <laughs> That's the world we live in. Um, thinking about my father when he was still alive, uh, bless his memory, uh, very bright, person who lived a long life, he had a hard time watching movies or TV shows that were recent because they were so quick. He, he couldn't follow the cuts, the jumps, the what, the this. On the other hand, our kids were now, you know, capable, intelligent young adults in their early 30s. For them to watch a movie uh, from the 1980s, even sort of an action flick, it, it's too slow. They're impatient. They want more stimulation now. So that's kind of the culture we live in. So this topic of patience has both a very important spiritual context as we deepen in our practice of presence and not craving and equanimity all the way to full awakening. Uh, it has a lot of practical value as well with other people. That's a very, very relevant topic. And one way to help this be grounded for you and concrete is to think about some situations that are real. 
uh, in which you started feeling impatient. You might also, as a way in, think about others who are impatient with you. They're putting pressure on you to speed up, get to the point, cut to the chase, hurry up, get this done faster. And how do you feel about that? So you can look at this topic through the perspective of uh, yourself reacting to others who are being impatient or from the perspective of yourself not being as patient as might be skillful. And you can even go back and forth between these perspectives. That really helps it become more and more real. So as context, it's very important to appreciate that the virtue of patience, the parami, or the perfection of patience, is not about putting up with being pushed around. It's not about letting conditions go on and go on that are not good for you or other people if you can do something about them. And you may know the term related to compassion of wise compassion and idiot compassion. Now, idiot compassion is a pretty tough term in a you know, fairly nice uh, Buddhist tradition. I think that term was came out of the Tibetan tradition and it, it's pointed, it's sharp. Uh, maybe someone knows better than, than uh, I do exactly where that term came from, but it's definitely kind of used. And it's, it's not that we're idiots, it's that they're versions of compassion that are not skillful. For example, um, if you watch someone who is hurting another person, like a bully, and you're observing a bully harming someone who has less power, and if you only have compassion for the bully and whatever anger or suffering is going on in the bully, that's not very helpful compassion. That could be called, if you will, idiot compassion, not helpful. Um, similarly, if we have idiot patience, if we just wait and wait for our partner to get the message about uh, what they need to do around the home, or if we just put up with a, an unskillful school teacher uh, in our, children, our child's second grade classroom who's not responding to the fact that we've got a pretty spirited, energetic, creative, intelligent, bouncy kid, that's not skillful patience. That's, call it, idiot patience. And it's very important to be clear that one of the things that helps uh, develop and practice skillful patience is to make sure that you're doing what you can to get the help you need as rapidly as possible to be sure that uh, you're not being obstructed uh, unnecessarily or harmfully by other people. Uh, if, for example, you need to get to your plane or a meeting on time and there are people standing in a hallway uh, obstructing traffic uh, with their big carts, talking with each other, their long lost best friends, uh, you know, it's okay, uh, hopefully civilly, you know, with wise speech, it's okay to say, pardon me, <laughs> need to get through here, <laughs> you know, uh, there's a place for that. So it's important to really take care of yourself. And I'm sure as we get into the discussion, we're going to be exploring how do we disengage from unskillful patients, unhelpful patients, to skillful patients, which sometimes involves appropriate assertiveness when it's time for that. Uh, one of the areas where I've seen people uh, put up with delays uh, is around taking care of their health. And obviously we're involved in healthcare systems that are highly unfair in all kinds of ways and have difficulties in them. And we're dealing with these systems as best we can. That said, if there are things we can do to accelerate the responsiveness of the healthcare system for proper assessment, proper diagnosis, second opinions, third opinions, proper treatment. Really, there's a, there's a place for that. And just 
not acquiescing uh, and subordinating ourselves unnecessarily. That's a major area. Another major area I've seen is um, with roommates or co-parents or both. When you've communicated, let's say, something that's appropriate around truly fair sharing of the load, or uh, you've communicated about the other person keeping their agreements or being responsive to your own needs, but they are not doing it. And so there you are, hmm, simmering, frustrated, maybe sputtering, maybe just mm, fuming in silence. That's not good for you. That's really not good for you. Maybe the other person just didn't understand. Or maybe the conditions are, you know, kind of getting in the way of them taking care of their side of the street. And maybe there's some practical things you could think about, perhaps. Or maybe they're just not really serious about keeping their agreements with you. And it's important to find that out. Uh, the sooner you find that out, the better, really. So that's the second area where I've seen people um, keep kicking the can down the road. And under the guise of being patient, actually and really being passive when, they, when it's not in their best interest or sometimes the interest of their children or others. Um, uh, just letting the days go by and become months and eventually years. So you might want to think about that. You might want to think about idiot patients. Forgive the term. It's not mine, uh, although I'm applying that to patients here. Uh, you might think about that. Okay. So let's assume <clears throat> that in a key relationship, uh, you're, you're doing what you can for your own basic well-being in ways we certainly talked about. You know, you're, you're trying to help yourself, uh, you know, regulate your physiology with decent food. You're trying to get some sleep. You know, you're drinking water, you're taking care of your needs as best you can. And also, let's say that, um, you know, there, you're, you're not being pushed around by somebody or endlessly deferring getting what you well deserve and need. Let's say that's true. Now, here you are, and they are telling you a long story. Or you're heading toward accomplishing X, and they suddenly want to tell you about Y, and that you need to do Y or something, right? Or they are repeating themselves. Or they are mixing three or four topics together and you're not really sure what the focus is or whatever it might be. And you might actually put into the chat for others situations in which you tend to get exasperated. For example, um, maybe you're in a group of some kind. You're at work, you're in a, you're in a meeting, or maybe you're with the relatives maybe online or in person, and someone is there who's just taking a long time to talk about something. And you start feeling like frustrated. You want to get something done. It's not life or death, but you're getting exasperated, kind of annoyed, uncomfortable with it. Maybe here, right? Maybe Someone asks me a question and I respond to it and you kind of wish I hadn't taken the bait or something. <laughs> you wish I'd talked about something else or maybe someone is speaking here and you're, you're like, Arr. well, maybe in a lot of these kind of situations, we can afford to be more patient. Why did the Buddha emphasize patience as a, a deeply important virtue? In patients, healthy patients, skillful patients, we are rested right there. We are resting right there in a kind of equanimity. We may be experiencing a little frustration, a little annoyance, a little boredom maybe, and we have a spaciousness around that experience. That's available to us. 
That's the essence of equanimity, a non-reactivity to our own reactions to the conditions around us. Being tranquil means having no reactions, more or less. Equanimity means not reacting to whatever's flowing through awareness, including our reactions. So as we're patient, we're, all, we're not racing, we're not pressuring, and we're not contracting. And you can feel these in your body. What does it feel like to speed up? What does it feel like to accelerate or want to accelerate and to get irritated because you're hitting an obstruction, this other person who's forcing you to slow down and is blocking your acceleration into whatever you want to think about or talk about or do? What's that feel like to accelerate? It's been very helpful for me to observe, including subtleties of speeding up accelerating. There's a place for accelerating. Sometimes you got to hit the gas to, you know, get around a traffic problem on the freeway. And sometimes you need to accelerate to deal with a social issue or to protect someone you care about or get something done or just because it's fun. You know, you're playing, you're having fun, you're uh, doing something in sports. You, you accelerate. Okay, there's a place for that. But a lot in our relationships, your acceleration becomes their stress. My acceleration becomes stressful for my wife and my coworkers and potentially. So what's it feel like to accelerate? Also, what does it feel like to pressure others, to feel pressured yourself, which has a sense of insistence in it, have to, must? What's that feel like? to have a sense of pressure with the contraction in it. That's also a clue to impatience. Pressure, contraction. You can be aware of that. Also implicit in impatience, which is central to the liberating heart of the Buddha Dharma, is a sense that the present as it is, is problematic. There's something missing that is important, or there's something wrong. That's the basis of the biological engine of craving. Something is missing or something is wrong. So the animal, the inner lizard, the inner mouse, the inner monkey, the inner early human, stone age human, contracts and pressurizes around dealing with what's missing and wrong. The problem is that much of the time, there's actually nothing missing or wrong. You can wait. We can let them have their 90 seconds to get to the point. Right? <laughs> you know, maybe it takes us an extra two minutes to get home after this clog in the traffic that is caused by someone who's unskillful as a driver, we, we can wait, right? Much of the time, we're actually okay in the present. It may not be great. Yeah, it'd be nice to get home an extra three minutes or two minutes or sooner to turn on the television or start your dinner. All right. But really, often in, in healthy patients, not idiot patients, when there's a real need at stake, but healthy patients... We can wait because we're all right in the present. It's an immediate teaching that we don't need to succumb to craving. Wow, with that other person. It's that profound. It's high value. <laughs> it sounds so modest. Right, right out of the, I don't know, I was a Boy Scout. I remember almost nothing, but maybe patience was one of the virtues. I forget. But anyway, patience sounds so eh, like third grade or something. It's profound to exercise patience, including with other people, when it's appropriate, right? And it's a practice in the moment of liberation from craving. It's a mini enlightenment in the moment that in which we're rested truly and fully in patience with another person. It's as if in our minds, including, you know, 
underlying bio neurological psychological processes, there are these two voices. One voice is saying, have to, have to, have to. And it's not always using words, right? There's just a, there's an image of a goal and gotta get it or push it away or freeze in the face of have to or cling to interpersonally, have to. Then there's another voice inside us, a voice of wisdom. When it's authentically the case, don't need to, don't need to, don't need to, don't need to, right? And you can feel the dialogue, the conflict, the, the back, the forth of those two voices. For, for many of us, have to, have to, have to is the chorus in the mind from very young. Sometimes because, and often because that's what other people were singing to us or telling us, have to, have to. You have to not make a mistake. You have to get this done. You have to do the dishes before daddy gets home. Um, you have to not make your, your mother angry. You, you have to, you have to. You have to avoid this to avoid, you know, those terrible painful experiences. You have to. And now we're adults and we live in the world of a lot of have to's our bosses, our demands, our schedules, have to, have to, and we internalize them. Sometimes we do have to. We have to take a breath. We have to get the invaders out of our country. We have to pass laws that protect people. We have to tell someone that we just can't live together anymore. Sometimes we have to. We, we have to um, get, you know, an answer from our doctor. We have to. There's a place for that. But much of the time, that other voice, don't need to, is the voice of wisdom. Imagine reminding yourself and telling yourself, don't need to. Don't need to. What, what a comfort that is, isn't it? And what a, a, a gift to yourself. You might even say it to yourself right now and see what it feels like. Use your name. I'll, I'll do it with you right now using my name. Rick, you don't have to. What's that feel like when you say that to yourself with your own name? In your own way. It's really powerful, isn't it? Don't have to. Don't need to. Don't need to. Right? It may, may be nice to uh, get there a little sooner. It might be nice to uh, uh, get a little more frosting on the cake. But don't need to, don't need to. Craving is about needing. That's its biological basis. When we don't feel that we need to, we are freed from craving. Right on the spot. Wow. So to finish here and then open it up for questions coming through the chat, maybe with someone uh, or two people directly, uh, when you think about other people that you tend to get impatient around, the habit of impatience, it can help you to be mindful of your own impatience. I'm definitely trying to be more mindful of all that myself. Second, it can help to stay relatively calm as best you can authentically. It's when we speed up that we tend to get impatient. We accelerate, accelerate, we rev up, we start um, getting a lot of activation of the sympathetic uh, branch, it's called, of the autonomic nervous system, fight-flight branch. Uh, mm. So just noticing that, trying to stay calmer, it really supports patience. Take a breath. Uh, widen your view. Get a sense of the situation as a whole. Raise your gaze. All these are neuro hacks that help support that calm centeredness. That's the basis for patience. It's also helpful to be deliberate in your own mind, in which you say to yourself with healthy patients, not idiot patients, I can listen to this for another two minutes. And let's see what happens. Two minutes, not a long time. Kind of like setting the inner clock. Sometimes, you know, like honestly with my dad, who is legendary for just going on forever. <laughs> <laughs> And it was lovable, but it 
promote impatience. Uh, I would just look at the clock and I would, you know, he, he would just then talk straight for the next two minutes. And then I'd say, well, dad, hang on a second. You've been talking straight here for two minutes. Uh, I, I want to see if I can get a word in. And, All right. And that's polite. You know, so it helps to know that you're bounding it. You, that can be helpful to you. So you make sure you're not being mistreated and you can still leave when you need to leave. Maybe letting people know that you know don't tend to respect your time, that you'll, need, you'll be leaving or ending at a certain time. You know, protect yourself. Those are things that are helpful. Another thing is to just look over there at that other person and maybe get a sense of the being behind their eyes or get a sense of your common humanity with them. How do you feel when people listen deeply and receive you and give you the gift of time? How do you feel? And imagine how they feel when you give them the gift of your full presence, your full attention, patiently. You can give them that gift and you can feel the longing in most other people often disguised under their cool act, but the longing in most other people to be really heard. In Dan Siegel's lovely phrase, to feel felt by you, patiently present, empathically present, while fully taking care of your own needs, taking care of your own rights, and bounding and knowing that you will bound, um, you, you know, the space you are making for that other person. Beautiful thing, isn't it, to give another person that gift. Uh, I'm reminded as I finish by a comment, a haunting, powerful comment from in where I live, a, a man named David Denman. Um, bless him, who was a longtime consultant with families that were getting ready to place their children but in different schools, and including potentially boarding schools for all kinds of reasons in a, a Marin County where I live, north of San Francisco, which is well, a fairly affluent um, suburban county on the edge of farmland with definitely um, a lot of people who, who living with us and us living with them, all of us living together, who are not advantaged in a variety of ways. In any case, David once made this comment that many, many parents will give their children everything except their time. Right? It's haunting. And it's profound to give other people the gift of our time. You know, a minute or so at a time with patience. So I'm going to take a look now. I hope you've been patient uh, <laughs> with me, rattling on in a variety of ways. I'll take a peek. Yeah, I totally understand the reaction to me conveying a term that I heard from others. You know, idiot compassion. I get it. Uh, it is certainly critical. It's sharp. It's pointed. And that's why I use generally unskillful, uh, unhelpful uh, impatience or unhelpful patience. So good. So Catherine, at 11 minutes past the hour, asked a question, what is the antidote to have to that can come before patients? Hmm. Interesting if I understand it. I think just noticing, you know, real-time mindfulness, mindfulness real-time with a certain granularity, what's actually happening. I think that's important. Uh, the foundation of any kind of wisdom or practice is clear seeing. So seeing what's true, recognizing, recognizing you're getting impatient, recognizing that another person is rattling on way past their, you know, their appropriate amount of time and you need to set a boundary. Either one, it's noticing those things. Great. So Martha asked a question at 17 minutes uh, past, and I love these super practical questions. It's like what William Blake, the world in a grain of sand, you know, there's a totality of practice in very simple examples. So Martha writes, Rick, what would you recommend for a quiet roommate who disregards basic acknowledgement of presence because he is on his phone or just quiet? And it sounds like a roommate who doesn't acknowledge you. First, be patient, please, while I take a little water. Um. On the one hand, 
and I, I get it. I get the situation. Uh, feeling like we do not exist for other people is profoundly disturbing. And even at the level of, for example, research on the so-called still face paradigm in which toddlers would sit in a high chair and just look at a parent, a mother or father, or a, you know, a, a caregiver, and um, the caregiver would have a stone face, a poker face. Within a dozen or two dozen seconds, the, the infant typically starts getting very upset and eventually quite quickly will even just go into collapse which is the worst it gets. And uh, that's really disturbing. You think of uh, the great punishment, apparently, in certain communities in which people are shunned and their friends and family will just walk by, uh, even if they're lying in a gutter, as if they do not exist. That's terrible. So there's there's something that can really get us. I, I understand that. When we're with others who don't, for whom we don't seem to exist. On the other hand, our most fundamental property is our attention. And maybe the truth is we don't want to give others our attention right now. And they're putting pressure on us because they're impatient or they want something. And, you know, we don't want to give it. And it's okay, maybe, not to give them our attention. That's why I think it's important to be respectful. And in the frame usually of a request, when we ask others for their attention, rather than just demanding it by barging in on it. I'm, I'm not saying that's what's happening here. I'm just trying to acknowledge you know, different aspects of this. And um, that said, then I think it's really helpful often when we live with others to establish agreement. It doesn't mean we need to get out a big procedure manual and you know, document every little detail, but a basic understanding. How, how can we live together? Uh, in hunter-gatherer bands, both in the world today and most likely as we lived for nearly, for most of our 300,000 years on this planet, 97% or so of our time on this planet in hunter-gatherer bands, there were understandings of how we, people would live together. There, were cult, there was culture, there was ritual, there were rhythms. Um, there was agreement, basic agreement in how to live together harmoniously in a way that was good for the group as a whole in which individuals could thrive by helping the group to thrive. In early, in hunter-gatherer bands, if the band does not thrive, no individual can thrive within it. So the band as a whole needs to thrive. Uh, so forming agreement and, and being explicit about it and feeling that you have the right to establish explicit agreements, especially if you've been disempowered of that right in how you've grown up or uh, by the culture in which you live. It's okay. Just think about it. You have the right to try to establish a mutual understanding. And if other people, uh, whether it's a casual roommate or a, a co-worker, um, a parent, a neighbor, if they are unwilling to engage a process that establishes a mutual understanding that is kept, that's utterly disruptive to a healthy relationship. And typically, as best one can, one needs to shrink the relationship, to resize the relationship to the scale that's safe. It's worth really paying attention uh, to other people's uh, capacity and motivation to establish mutual understandings that are mainly, if not entirely, honored, and in which there's the capacity to to a to reestablish them if they're disrupted. Pay attention to that. If other people blow up the establishing of mutual understanding, that's a huge red flag in any relationship, especially a significant one. Right? The most fundamental agreement is to keep your agreements. Turn it around and to be someone oneself who's prepared to enter into a process in which others have power. Uh, it's mutual power uh, to establish a shared understanding for living together, really important. And to try to create some kind of clarity. So with this roommate question, um, <clears throat> maybe as best you can, you find a way to talk about it. A lot of this happens sort of implicitly and tacitly, and it, that's fine. Maybe euphemisms are used to sort of keep the peace and, you know, I don't know, 
grease the grease the wheels, it's okay. Sometimes though, you need to be pretty explicit about it. So maybe you know to kind of surface it, like, oh, hey, when I come into a room, um, you know, I, 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 it helps me to kind of feel like there's a recognition that I'm actually here. Um, what's that like for you? You might ask. And then the other person, maybe the quiet roommate, says, honestly, uh, I know you're there, but I, I don't really want to give you my attention, and I've never thought I had to. I thought it would be clear to you that, of course, I know you're here. My, you know, I, my hearing works. <laughs> I know you're in the room, and it and and also, like, to be blunt, um, I don't owe you my attention, right there. Wow, that's pretty straightforward. Now, you might feel, oh, you owe me my, your attention, but then you might think, well, actually, is that fair? Now, if they're your mate or <clears throat> you walk into the room saying the house is on fire, yeah, maybe they do owe you their attention. But a lot, you know, another person might say, I don't mind being requested. I don't want to be demanded regarding my attention. And that's useful to kind of sort this out. It, and it actually helps to kind of be clear about it because there's a fair amount of upset with people. Sometimes this shows up tracking gender to some extent, to the extent that those are useful distinctions. Uh, in any case, it's helpful to kind of negotiate it. And uh, a person, let's say the quiet roommate, might realize, or you might even say, oh, it actually will take very little to give the other person a sense of their needs being met very often to come to a mutual understanding that enables mutual patience, it doesn't take very much, right? Uh, often there's the, for example, in this case, the quieter person might just sort of glance up and that's good enough. So you might just make a little, a quick eye contact or they might promise that if they're quiet when you enter the, the shared home, that they'll be a little back and forth, you know, if they're in the common space uh, before they, you know, withdraw to their own bedroom. Something often are very simple, easy things, and then the other person can give you what you need, so you can give them what they need, which is a a sense of a a space of being in their own world that's not an, not intruded upon, inadvertently, unwittingly, say, um, by you. Let's say, I hope that this is not overlong. In any case. Um, there's a lot in it that I think that's pretty relevant for people in general. Uh, what is the purpose of impatience? I think there's a certain biological basis for it in evolution. Rachel asks, 22 minutes past. Um, and I think there's a lot of um, learned impatience from the culture and different subcultures in the culture. I have, I have a friend from the East Coast of America. He's from Jersey. And he's kind of impatient. He's I'm we're in California, you know, my my culture a lot kind of runs through the Midwest. People hang out with each other. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with children. You know, you sort of hang out. So there's a collision, right? So there's a certain amount of impatience that can actually be learned. Okay. Great. Well, someone um, private messages me something that's really important. I want to be clear. So this person says, um, you know, my child will not talk to me, an adult child. My adult child will not talk to me, and it's been over a year. How can I be patient with that? Well, two things. First, we feel our feelings. Understandable. It's a wound. It's a loss. It's usually unjust. Occasionally, adult kids cut off a relationship with their parent because that parent is abusive and has no learning curve and will not repair. And it's just crazy making. That's occasionally the case. Very often, frankly, in my observation, adult children cut off contact with their siblings and or um, their parents in ways that are lazy and selfish and deeply hurtful uh, with a parent who's very prepared to acknowledge their wrongs and to repair. Um, so that said, it's still really painful. So nothing I'm saying is about avoiding that. We can be patient with our own pain, our own grief, 
We can be patient with ourselves while we feel it, absolutely. We can also be patient with conditions that are not changing over which we have no control. There you are. You are coming to the airport and your flight has been canceled and you have to wait three hours at the airport for the next flight to the city you're going to. What are you going to do? You want to pound your fist forever, even though you feel like it? No, you take a breath, get a magazine, call a friend, get a meal, do what you can um, patiently while you wait. Sometimes we can't do anything about conditions, so we cultivate a certain capacity. The Buddha talked about this a lot, in which we're, we feel the first arrow, the first dart of understandable frustration, or in this case, deep hurt and loss. You know, I have in my extended family system people that really have cut off other people in that system, including me. And on any given day, I hope it will change, and so far it hasn't, and the years go by. Probably will never change. You know? Acceptance, recognizing the larger whole, looking deep in our heart and forgiving ourselves for whatever our part was and seeing the bigger picture and finding uh, support and love elsewhere as best we can. I mean, these are all parts of it, certainly. Uh, endurance. You know, there's so much in this life that is sad and, and, and painful and sometimes horribly so. Uh, and still, what do we do? Uh, we find ways to keep living. We include it. I have a friend um, who lost her daughter, her adult daughter, to cancer about nine months ago. She just wrote me today about it and it reminded me. And she's living with that most grievous loss, right? And still, and still, the sun rises. And still, there are other people to be with. There, there are still things to do. There are meals to eat. There is this life and there is the opportunity for practice and still. And these are things that can be really helpful even as we very honestly and authentically bear the pain of something like uh, being rejected and cut off by um, a child, our own child. Well. And meanwhile, right? In the everyday, kind of more kind of casual, rough and tumble of daily life, see what it's like this week to deliberately practice patience with other people. When you want to speed them up or cut them off or make something happen faster that doesn't really need to. And especially, more broadly, be aware of that those two voices inside you. Have to. Don't need to. Don't need to. Don't need to. All right. Take good care of yourself, and I'll see you next week.